Our minds and bodies are not prepared for the Pacific. Its size is staggering. It defies us by being too diverse, too contradictory. We beg for some boundaries that would lessen our overwhelming feeling of awe. Here in the South Pacific, it can look like Norway or the Alps. some, the Pacific is a particular lagoon, small village, or strip of white sand. For others, it is some remote part of us that seems to be locked in the past forever. Very soon, we will no longer be able to observe primitive human cultures directly. Our last chance to see them is right now, before these remnants of man's past rapidly disappear forever from the face of the earth. The South Pacific represents a landmark in human history. Few peoples have ever been subjected to such extraordinarily rapid and far-reaching change. Thousand-year-old Stone Age cultures transported in a few decades into the Atomic Age. It is not just a few small currents but rather a tidal wave that is now sweeping over the vast, sun-drenched Pacific. about the Pacific in three books, traveled here often, and even survived three major mid-Pacific airplane crashes. All this by no means guarantees that I really understand the Pacific. It's too enormous, too varied. My name is James Michener. This look at the South Pacific is not designed as a guide for travelers, nor is it in any way intended to be comprehensive it is simply a brief personal impression. We'll be as factual as possible, but for facts alone, there are encyclopedias. Dealing as we are here with such vastness, silence, and human diversity, facts by themselves are often inadequate and sometimes misleading. The South Pacific is surely the most romanticized and stereotyped portion of our planet. 
writers and artists, first attracted by the legend, became part of the legend themselves. Robert Louis Stevenson, Herman Melville, Jack London, Joseph Conrad, and Paul Gauguin. In the year 1790, nine mutinous sailors led by the notorious Fletcher Christian with 18 Tahitian men and women started their own isolated world on this uninhabited peak of a dead volcano, two square miles called Pitcairn Island, a thousand miles of ocean from any other human soul. Here, over the long and lonely years, their numbers grew. The people of Pitcairn have little to contribute except their own survival. They are the curios of the South Pacific, but perhaps not for long. Her name is Brenda Christian. She is a direct descendant of Fletcher Christian. It was here on Pitcairn Island that he and his men burned the bounty. From that day on, they renounced the world which they had made their enemy. The Pitcairn people are seamen, descendants of Englishmen and Tahitians. After 200 years, they survived many generations of inbreeding. The tape recorder plays back the sounds of the outside world. I wish you a good luck. And one day we might see Patience you for the old Restlessness for the young. This generation could be the last. Each year the ships grow fewer. Each one now looks more desirable than the last as it sails away. But the sons and daughters of Fletcher Christian's little band continue to live on this solitary island, surrounded by the sea. Try to imagine the unimaginable, an ocean that curves from Southern Asia to South America in a full semicircle, an arc extending halfway around the globe. With 1,200 languages spoken, it contains nearly a quarter of all the world's tongues. From where did these different people come? That is the very question posed by this mysterious speck of land, Easter Island, situated in the eastern corner of the Pacific. Sentinels of stone and silence on Easter Island communicate to us now across time and space without the need for words. Although the air still seems to vibrate with their ancient purpose, we do not really know which people carved these colossal heads. Hundreds of heads in various stages of completion within the quarry strongly suggest that the work crews dropped their tools and hastily departed in a single day. We are now nearly a third of a world away from Easter Island, yet we still border on the Pacific Ocean. This time, we are at its western edge in New Guinea. There are no fewer than 700 cultures here, 
with 700 different languages. Here, in hidden valleys of great beauty, beyond the framework of our modern concepts of time, live peoples who until recently have been completely untouched by our civilization, direct survivors of the Stone Age. We are in a part of the world that is largely unknown, barely understood. There are villages within five miles of each other which speak entirely different tongues. In a two-day canoe ride, the language can change 10 times. The men of this Azmat village, located in the vast coastal swamplands of New Guinea, are preparing for a raid. If it is successful, they will kill their enemies and eat their flesh. For these men are headhunters and cannibals. They belong to a society of violence, but a society that many would hasten to add is really no more violent or warlike than our own. They lived undisturbed, protected by their swamps, until just over 20 years ago, when stories of their extraordinary carvings reached the rest of the world. Each village lives in fear of attack from its neighbors, for reprisal and revenge are obligations no asthmat can avoid. Soon will come the ceremonial climax of two months of preparation. What about the outsiders of the Pacific? Those foreigners who were not native to this ocean and who invaded it a few centuries ago. With their arrival began an inevitable destruction. Captain Cook, who landed on nearly every island group in the South Pacific and other explorers, brought in three Western exports which began the destructive process, syphilis, iron, and whiskey. Closely following them came New England whalers, and then in turn adventurers, drinkers, gamblers, and finally missionaries. These white foreigners were in search of their own vision of paradise, believing it would soon arise in their midst.
their vision became a self-fulfilling prophecy. In time, they underwent a sort of lobotomy of memory, recalling only that which matched their own dreams. They did not lie, they simply forgot. Even in the most isolated areas of the South Pacific, profound changes are coming. Eniwetak Atoll is a circle of tiny islands on a coral reef surrounding a large lagoon. The people in Eniwetak for a thousand years lived undisturbed by the rest of the world. In 1947, the United States accepted the United Nations trusteeship for all of Micronesia. It agreed that the interests of the Micronesians were paramount. But within months, the interests of the Eniwetok people were pushed aside. Although the Eniwetok people didn't know it, their atoll had been chosen as the site for testing the world's first hydrogen bomb. This is Ujilang, 125 miles from Eniwetok. It was to this barren, tiny, typhoon-swept atoll that the 142 people of Eniwetok were moved by the Navy. In 1968, they petitioned the United Nations to return them to Eniwetok. Finally, Eniwetok was officially returned to its people. In 1977, they were told they could choose 56 of their number to return to Eniwetok Atoll. March 15, 1977, the ship that was to return the chosen few appeared in the lagoon. Those chosen included the oldest men and women who asked to go home before they died. they have arrived and are greeted at Eniwetok Atoll by a United States military representative. The first morning, they looked around and found that 78 of them, not the authorized 56, had made the voyage. 22 stowaways could not bear to be left behind. In Jebi, where half of the Atoll's people once lived, will remain too radioactive to live on for an estimated 30 years. Neighboring Runet is contaminated by plutonium, which has a half-life of 25,000 years. That means in 25,000 years, Runet will be only half as radioactive as it is today. In other words, it will remain off limits to human beings forever.
many winds of change are blowing throughout the Pacific. The mission post is a full day's journey from the village. There, a lone priest faces the task of bringing the local people into the modern world. Oil companies, timber firms, and missionaries. The modern world is threatening to overwhelm the native people of New Guinea with disturbing new concepts of time, money, and work. Payday becomes a lesson in simple economics. Denied their ceremonies by the government, and now deprived of their hunting and gathering grounds, they have a bleak future. Oil deposits have been found, and the swamp lands are already parceled out among the international oil companies. Other interests are moving in as well. Unless their way of life is protected, these people may be the very last survivors of their kind. How long can it last unspoiled? At no other moment in history has it been possible for us to see such a varied expanse of time and space. But the moment is highly perishable. The very technology that brought it close to us is in the process of transforming it. The Pacific has withstood explorers, colonists, whalers, missionaries, traders, adventurers, drifters, dreamers, great wars and thermonuclear bombs. Somehow, in some form, it will survive this revolution. The Pacific is not a paradise for everyone. For many, the pace is too slow. But for those whose bodies and brains can sustain an assault of physical beauty that is soaring and spectacular to the point of disbelief, the South Pacific is still a paradise. As mysterious ever-changing and fulfilling as it is vast. I'm James Michener.